started, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name's Ken Donnell and I'm the Information Services Librarian here at Kayama Library. Um, and welcome to our World War I presentation featuring Dr. Richard Reed. Um, just a short bio on Richard. Irish born and educated, Richard worked for more than 40 years as a high school teacher, museum educator, historian and museum creator, curator. 30 of those years were spent in working for institutions such as the Australian War Memorial, the Australian, the National Museum of Australia, the Senate and the Department of Veterans Affairs. In 2011, he was the senior curator for the National Museum's exhibition on the Irish in Australia exhibition called Not Just Men. Richard has written widely on the subject of Australia at war and of the story of the Irish in Australia and in relation to both those subjects has led tours to Ireland, the Western Front in France and Belgium and to Gallipoli. Recently retired from the Australian Public Service, Richard is still involved in a major archaeological and historical survey of the Anzac area on the Gallipoli Peninsula and various projects on the emigration of the Irish to Australia during the 19th century. Among Richard's publications are A Decent Set of Girls, Farewell My Children, Bomber Command, Sinners, Saints, and finally Settlers, A Journey Through Irish Australia. Now, as you can probably see, we'll be filming this talk, so uh, um, we'll be trying to get it up online on YouTube as soon as possible. Um, also, you might see at the back there, there are some information brochures and uh, bookmarks um, on Kaima District World War I soldiers. So feel free to um, grab any of those, as many as you like. Um, also, if you've got a mobile phone, please turn it to silent. Um, could you please join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Reed? Thanks very much, Ken. Um, I don't know why I didn't come here, but the face is right. You've all heard me before, I'm obviously. I don't need to get all this. Uh, I'd just like to, to say a very special hello to uh, my old friend Wade Holborn down there. I mean, we're sitting in the centre. Uh, that was largely Ray's creation. In fact, I'd say almost totally Ray's creation. Um, is the plaque still out there, Ray? Right? Macy Cleary coming here in 19 whenever it was. It's on the rock. On the rock. It's on the rock, yeah. That's good because uh, certainly that was a, a fantastic achievement to get that family history centre up and to and to keep it going. But obviously it has been greatly changed since I was last here. I can't remember when I was last here. It's getting terrible. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know, and I know that some of you do, uh, I spent the first uh, ten and a half years of my Australian life, which now stretches over 42 years, in Kiama. Um, I didn't teach in Kiama. Some people tend to think that I did. I didn't. I taught up at Bullingon. Ten and a half years. I'll tell you how I got here. It was very simple. My uh, wife and I arrived in Sydney in 1972 in January, January the 12th. I never forget the date. And it started to pour with rain. I mean, this was a great shock you know, to somebody. A couple of unexpected kangaroos to be bounding around the place. Uh, you know, uh, spiders to be under the toilet seats in places like Annandale and things of this nature. But anyway, we were sent uh, to Wollongong uh, to teach. Uh, we had to sort of spend a week in the, in the, in a, the what they call the School of the Air in Sydney, where we found out where we were going to be sent. We got sent down to, to Wollongong, we got into a car, we hired a car in Wollongong, and we drove through all these suburbs. It was an awful look, isn't it? Big steelworks and you know, pollution and uh, all the rest of it. Then we drove a bit further south, past Shell Harbour, over that hill, and suddenly there's Kayama. And I thought to myself, that's the place, you know, we will, we will settle there. We did. Uh, and I spent ten and a half years very happily trolling up and down to Kira Boys High School, 50 minutes each, uh, one way, 50 minutes the other, every single day for ten and a half years. I don't regret it. Um, but one of the things that sort of uh, has intrigued me looking back on all that was that I, I eventually got very interested in Kaiama's own history. And I still think there's a, there's a place for that history to be written and to be written properly. Uh, it's not there yet. I mean, there's some quite good early books, by the way. Um, poor old uh, guy from Bulleye High School, Bill Bailey. Bill comes in for a lot of flack uh, on the stuff that he wrote back in the 60s, but uh, he pioneered the way. You know, wrote all those histories uh, of those various places. 
uh, and credit, all credit to him, and left a wonderful legacy up in the Mitchell Library, a wonderful index of all the photographs and the images he looked at. So Bill was a pioneer. But really, since Bill, no one's come out with you like a kind of authoritative history. Uh, I'm speaking here in a snobbish way, uh, an academic one, if you like, but one that's readable and that's interesting uh, about this place. Uh, and I think it deserves it. Uh, there's a couple of theses, and I've seen them, but they're not really there yet. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And one of the areas that eventually I ended up being very intrigued by was Kayam, obviously, during the First World War. That wasn't initially, by the way. I would have spent years and years going past this, as you all know, right? the War Memorial. Sorry about the elongated one there, it was my bad <laughs> positioning on me there. Going past that, uh, there wasn't a roundabout there then, you just came around the corner and headed off into uh, Wollongong. Uh, and we've seen it every day and never given it a second thought. Um, obviously, coming from, from Ireland, one of the really strange institutions in this country was Anzac Day. Uh, although I've been here 42 years, I can't speak about Anzac Day as a native. It just isn't there. Uh, and I think you have to grow up with it. You have to grow up with what all that meant and how that sort of got into communities and what it meant to communities to come out on Anzac Day, to be part of a march, to watch local people uh, being involved. I didn't grow up with that. Uh, so I still am a little bit, if you like, detached and stand back and look, this is really interesting. This is something authentically Australian that I, you know, no matter how long I'll be here, uh, I'll not be fully part of that. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying that's just a sort of fact. So I can remember Anzac days in Kira Boys High School, which were really fascinating because our headmaster, Jack Johnson, was a, was a veteran, a World War II veteran. And actually, a World War II veteran who spoke perfect Japanese, would you believe? Something he never said. And I only found out years later he'd been an interpreter at the war crimes trials in Rabaul after the end of the war. Uh, and Jack would say very little about that. But we'd have an Anzac Day ceremony every year. We'd be in the, in the school hall. Well, here didn't have one. It was the Wollongong High School Hall. And that was the day when there was a car park between Kira Boys High School and Wollongong High, which we called the Gaza Strip. Uh, <laughs> because, of course, on one side were all the supposed dunces of Kira Boys High, on the other side, the academic cream of uh, Wollongong in uh, Wollongong High School. Uh, I don't believe that, by the way, but that's the way it was, it was sort of presented right, to, to the kids at the time. Anyway, we used to have these Anzac Day ceremonies, and we had a school cadet corps, and we'd have a, a cenotaph on the stage. Uh, and the, the cadet corps would mount a, a guard of honour beside the cenotaph, and we'd, we'd hold this Anzac Day ceremony. But behind it, there'd be a Union Jack. Uh, and I'll never forget a staff meeting when a friend of mine, Steve Boyle, he's still alive and up there in uh, Wollongong, stood up and said, uh, Headmaster, you know, do you not think maybe we could move on to having the Australian flag, you know, behind the cenotaph? And Jack says, no. Why do we have the Union Jack? Because I like it. <laughs> now that was the end of the discussion. No more discussion. But it, interesting because Jack was of an older Australia. Uh, and it's fascinating to think that the official flag in the First World War was the Union Jack. The, the oldest, the, the, sorry, the only surviving flag uh, for a battalion that, that still exists that flew on Gallipoli over a battalion headquarters at Gallipoli was a flag presented to the 13th Battalion of New South Wales. You'll find it up in the Anglican Cathedral in Newcastle. I know about it because, as a member of the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Commemorations Branch, we gave them some money to restore this flag, and it's genuine. Uh, and it's not an Australian flag, it's a Union Jack. And it was presented to the 13th Battalion for reasons I have yet to, got to get to the bottom of, by the Ulster Society of New South Wales before they sailed off uh, in, in 1914. I sort of often wondered, was there a, a large contingent of Orangemen in, a, in the 13th Battalion, or of Ulster people, who, I had no idea, but they presented it to them, there is, there is the flag. So, you know, getting inside this, this Anzac thing was, was not something that, that I was really into at all. As I say, I would pass this memorial by uh, and never give it a second thought. Until I left the place. Isn't that inevitable? You know, you leave a place and suddenly you say, well, everything that was there is now more interesting uh, to me. The Irish have been interesting to me here, but that's another talk. You have to come tomorrow afternoon for that one. Uh, to to tell you it's about something else. So there is the memorial. It, it sort of sits there. You, you, you cannot ignore it. Uh, this is something about Australia that Ken Inglis, uh, an academic who I got to know very well, Professor Ken Inglis at the Australian National University, one of my supervisors for my PhD. Ken reckons there are more memorials per head in Australia 
for the First World War than any other country on earth. I'm not sure he's absolutely right about it. I don't know. I'd say what you'd have to do is include all the honor boards and all that sort of stuff as well in schools, etc., etc., to arrive at that. Uh, if you look at England, actually, there's a lot of local memorials in England, a hell of a lot. But whether they're in the schools or not is another matter. I really don't know that. I, I do know in Australia that in a lot of the public schools you go into, there's the honor board from the First World War, or you know, you go into to private schools, there they are in Riverview and places like that. There, there are those. So maybe he's right about that. Certainly, there was a huge effort at the end of the First World War to commemorate and to remember what had gone on. And I still wonder why it was that there was such an effort here in Australia by comparison with other places. So it's a, it's a topic you know, that's, that, that's absolutely huge, and I don't have a particular answer to it. But it's prominent. You cannot avoid it. You live in a place, you see it. Uh, and it has a message, of course, that says, lest we forget. And I'm going to come around uh, to that a little later on. Um, one of the interesting things that I recently you know, started to look at for Kyama once I left, and the reason, by the way, I got interested is that uh, I was friendly with a local high school teacher. He was the um, subject master in the Kyama High School, John Shoebridge. I'm going to come back to that uh, later. Uh, and John and I got a little project going that I'm going to dwell on a little bit uh, for the second half of this talk. But um, anyhow, I sort of always thought that the story uh, it's the story that often doesn't get told. It's, it's not just about the locality, and that is part of it, but it's the connection. It's the connection between here, which is visible on that memorial, the names, and all that stuff that's gone on all those thousands of miles away. Uh, at the time, um, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, I was part of a kind of curriculum group among history teachers in New South Wales. We were developing a particular part of the history curriculum, which still, I think, is very relevant in terms of the way we did it which was talking about the local, national, international approach. That's to say, if you've got a bunch of high school kids in year 10 on a wet Friday afternoon, how do you keep them interested in anything in every time of history? You know, you've got to think of those things. And one of the sort of ways we came up with this was get them involved in what's local, what they can see locally, and get them starting asking questions uh, about that. So we started that, I uh, started to do that in, in Kira Boys High School, for, for, for example. And we ran this amazing project. I will get to Kyla, by the way. Uh, around this amazing, we ran this amazing project, which was to see could we find a veteran of the First World War. Now we're talking about the early 1980s, right? They were still there. And um, one of the teachers in the school, Bob McIntosh, his father, Andrew McIntosh, had fought in the First World War. Old Mr. McIntosh. So we had him in, and we interviewed him uh, because his name was on the local memorial. And so we could send kids down there and say, go pick a name, right? And we obviously get them steered around this uh, eventually. Anyway, he came in and we interviewed him. He was at that stage in his 80s, and he was blind. And he claimed all sorts of things about what he'd done in the First World War. He said he'd been at the Third Battle of Ypres, that's Passchendaele, uh, in, in 1917, you know, and then on in 1918. And so we just took all that for granted, what, he, what he'd said. This was the first interview. Then we got his actual record. Uh, from Melbourne, because in those days you didn't have it up on the net. There's no internet. Uh, anything we found out about it, we got him to sign a letter saying we could look at his original dossier. He had to get that permission. Now they're all up, free for all, uh, on, on the internet, with all the nasty bits included about people's behavior in the First World War. Uh, anyhow, he gave his permission. Back in Kent, we discovered he never fought a passion down. He'd arrived there in the 1st Battalion two weeks after it all finished. As a young 18-year-old, actually he was underage, uh, and eventually his father and his mother applied to the authorities, even wrote a letter all the way to General Birdwood in, in uh, France, saying he's underage, he shouldn't really be up there at the front, and he got brought back into a casualty clearing station. Uh, that was if you like a mass unit in the First World War, the closest that nurses got to the front line to, serve, to look after wounded you know, men who were really badly injured but quickly uh, operated on by surgeons. And we discovered he'd, he'd been in this third casualty clearing station, and that really his the stories in his head about Passchendaele were all stories being told to him by these veterans who were there you know, when he'd been with the unit for, for a couple of weeks. So he'd remembered those all right. Uh, so he wasn't quite accurate, but the third casualty clearing station became fascinating. So we had him back in and we confronted him you know, with the evidence, you know, well, Andrew, absolutely, you know, Passchendaele. This, well, we do remember that. Yeah, etc., uh, etc. Et and I remember he said the guy who was the head of that 
casualty clearing station, the, the chief surgeon, he was a guy, we called him Queenie. Queenie? I said, well, who's that? Earl Page, founder of the country party. <laughs> I don't know why he got the name. I never really asked about that. But he had a marvellous set of stories about the casualty clearing station once he started to talk about it. And what he started to talk about became very, very real because it was no longer sort of, you know, talking about any, any kind of daring do that you might think exists about being a soldier. It doesn't exist. We know that now. But anyway, it certainly wasn't about that. It was about the fact that he had to clear out the limbs from the operating theatre after the end of operations that had taken off men's arms and legs and things like that and take them away, being one of his tasks as an order in the hospital. And I think that little project convinced me that there's an aspect of the war that we don't tend to dwell on too much, and that's the real aspect of it. What has actually gone on? What was it like to be in these places? The memorial just has the name up there, but the name doesn't give you the story. And really, when it comes down to it, if you're asking now, these are the four years, aren't they coming up 14, 15, 16, 17, 18? But if we want to start thinking about, you know, what has World War I meant to Australia and Australians, we've got to get into the stories of what happened to the people who lived around us, right, in this area, who went off to those wars. Some of them never came back, some of them did. What happened to them? Uh, just knowing that they went isn't enough, in my view. Now, I suppose that comes from having spent 10 years working at the Australian War Memorial. But the memorial there too can, you know, can sometimes not necessarily show you what it was really like. Uh, people are too confronted by that. You know, the, the, act, the actuality of war is a confronting topic. I understand that. But I sort of feel that you've got to start trying to think about it. And what I'm going to try and do this afternoon is, is tell you a couple of stories about it in relation to Kayama that will bring that home. And if people here are going to do something over the next sort of three or four years to open up the topic, if you like, of what was first the First World War all about in this community, there's plenty of material out there. You've got plenty in your own library. Just look at all this stuff that Ken has put up. I got onto the internet site for Kayama Library, which doesn't let me download a single image, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was tremendous. There's a tremendous amount of material floating around in the ether here. Uh, about that experience. It could really make the, the makings of a very interesting sort of study of the whole thing. And the first one I wanted to mention, because I remember driving past this place every day as I drive up to Wollongong, I go past Dunmore House. Uh, and Dunmore House, of course, is still there. At that stage, I don't know what it is now, but it was uh, I was still, I think, in the Fuller family. And the Fullers actually had been immigrants from Galway in Ireland uh, in, the, in the 1830s, producing family and Dunmore, the big fort, you know, in, in, in terms of Irish. Uh, so I went past that house, and only three weeks ago, I was at a place in Gallipoli, because I've been involved in this uh, archaeological historical survey of the Anzac battlefield. We're going to be talking on that, and we'll never get to Kyama. So uh, anyway, on that battlefield, would you believe it? Uh, and I only realized that I was, I was walking around a particular part of it about three weeks ago. There's a very fascinating Kyama connection. And it relates to this guy, Colin Dunmore Fuller, uh, who in the First World War had been the commanding officer of the 6th Light Horse Regiment. Not initially, he was made the commanding officer late in 1915 at Gallipoli. Uh, and then for the, up until about 1918, he was the commanding officer of that unit in the Middle East and all that Middle Eastern campaign through uh, Jerusalem and uh, Baghdad and all, not Baghdad, uh, etc. Et so a fascinating story and a fascinating local connection. Uh, and he appeared in this book, wonderful title, Under Furred Hats. I don't know what it means, actually. I haven't got to grips with it yet. It was a, it was a history of the Sixth Light Horse by this guy, George L. Berry, Lieutenant. And here he had a, a photograph of Lieutenant Colonel Fuller, actually, uh, in, in the book. The reason I, I came across the book was because I was working at a particular spot on the south of the Lippin. I'll come to that now. On the 19th, 20th December 1915, Colin Fuller of Dunmore was one of those people who was on the extreme periphery of the Anzac area on Gallipoli and was part of the evacuation. The evacuation, as you know, took place, the main bit of it, on the night of the 19th, 20th December 1915. And in Underfurred Hats, it describes the last little contingent of the sixth light horse who at the very southern tip of Gallipoli. I'll show you a photograph of it in a moment. The very most isolated position called Wilson's Lookout, uh, which was part of the Sixth Light Horses, part of the front line, 
And this is how they described these guys coming up through the trench to evacuate Gallipoli. At last, a moment arrived, meeting at the tunnel head at half past two. The sentries in Chatham's post heard soft footfalls coming along the gallery. Silently, they took their places in the line, and with muffled footsteps, the final party of diehards followed the long sap up the main ridge from Chatham's post, through the top tunnel, and out onto the terrace beyond. Lieutenant Colonel Fuller bringing up the, the rear and blowing out the candles. What a phrase, blowing out the candles. What's it mean? Well, they were in underground tunnels, and they had candles all the way along these tunnels. And uh, what the place looked like, they were right down here. Here's Anzac Cove, and right down here on this thing called Harris Ridge. Just down here, there's Chatham's Post just there, and it's the very tip of the Anzac position at Gallipoli, these, that the, the Anzacs built. And that's what it looked like in, in 1919, when Charles Bean went back with an Australian historical mission and got photographs taken. Looking here, over here to this side is the sea. This is what they call the Valley of Despair. That's Holly Ridge there. Uh, coming up here is Poppy Valley. You see, that's all this long trench, right all the way out here to there. And that's where Colin Fuller was, right, on the night of the 19th, the 20th of December, walking all the way back with the last guys through all this and then up Chatham's post and uh, off Gallipoli. So he'd been one of the last guys on Gallipoli. And there's a kind of story for you. Uh, uh, his name, I suspect, is on the morning. Has to be, but well, it's not, it should be. Right? Because he, he's a lot of, he didn't get killed, of course. Uh, I, don't know, I didn't look at his full record. But that's what I mean by embedded in that memorial. There's all sorts of stuff. I didn't know this until I suddenly made the connection coming down here. I made that connection about him because I'm writing a book uh, along with another seven or eight people on the survey we've been doing at Gallipoli for Cambridge University Press, and I was looking at these trenches. I had looking at the Sixth Life Force, looking at their war diary, looking at that book about them, and I saw him, Lieutenant Colonel Fuller, blew out the candles. And I actually put that uh, in the book, and it wasn't until I was coming down here, I said, oh, who's Colin Fuller? Oh, Colin Fuller, God's sake, you know, it's a Kayama connection. And that sort of story is everywhere, right? There is no doubt about that. And that's the kind of thing I think, if you're thinking next year, right, which is the 100th anniversary, obviously, of the landing in Gallipoli, and then the experience of the Australians in Gallipoli, the question you need to start asking is, who are the local people who were actually there? You know, and, and did they get killed there? And if they came back, what were their memories of that place? Is anything get left around in the ethos to find out? People talk about the Anzacs all the time. Uh, and actually, it's interesting, you know, the only people entitled to call themselves Anzacs are those who served at the Gallipoli. Right? The phrase has been kind of cute, the word has been greatly expanded, mean anyone who serves in the, the Australian Armed Service. Not true. In 1918, those who had fought at Gallipoli were given a special A, brass A, to put on their uniform uh, with their colour patch to show they had been at Gallipoli. Greatly resented by guys who'd gone over in 1916 and 17 and fought in those terrible actions on the Western Front. Why were these guys single out? Uh, there were only, there were about 50,000 Australians served on Gallipoli, 8,700 killed, uh, didn't come back, and the rest would have been entitled had they survived Tour de France in 1918, to have put the brass A Anzac up on their shoulder flesh. And they are the Anzacs, only those who served there. I'll come back to that a little bit later. So there's Colin Fuller for that story. So, we've got the local memorial, and uh, Ken kindly sent me this, I didn't quite know where he got it from, it's, uh, it's a, in a book, presumably, Ken, it? Yeah, which shows the arch and then all the names on it. So what I started to do for, for this was simply to unpack a few of these names. You know, who are these guys? Uh, it's very interesting, actually, because, and I haven't got time to go through all this, but there's a fair number on there who are not Kiowa at all, you know, who are associated with here in, in, in some way. And actually, it's quite interesting that the, the first Kayama recruit, I think, I think, to be killed uh, in the First World War at Gallipoli is actually from Victoria, not from here. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Another of Locke's names on there that I could not work out at all while they were here. You know, looking at their record and everything else, they must have been working here and joined up or something of that nature. Who knows? Memorials are funny things. I did a study with a colleague of mine, Cheryl Mungan, years ago, 1998, uh, of the memorial in Yass. Uh, the memorial in Yass is the soldiers' hall as you drive through, and you go inside the main doors, there's all the names. Uh, we, we took the whole thing apart, 
And we wondered as we were doing that, you know, why some names weren't there, why some names were there, where they come from. There was a camp, a labor camp, but they probably jumped down and things of that nature. So there were blokes joined up who had nothing to do with Yas at all. But, but, but when they were killed, they were claimed by Yas because they had come from there. And also there were all sorts of names missing, names that should have been on there. Think about that for a minute. Uh, you know, are there names that ought to be on the memorial? Well, probably there are. Uh, the reason for that was in, in 1924, when the Yas Memorial was unveiled uh, by Pompey Elliott, famous general from the First World War, uh, the Yas paper had weeks and weeks and weeks before that been saying, right, there's a committee which is going to decide what the names are, send the names in, send the names in. And there was a date, I can't remember the date, the final group must be sent in now because the monumental mason is chipping away you know, at the, at the at the thing to, 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 to put up, and then that's it. It's open. It's finished. Of course, it wasn't. You know, there were lots of people who didn't actually send the name and didn't get on there. So don't think what you're looking at with this is a kind of definitive right, uh, discussion about all those names that ought to be there, or the people who served from the area. It's much more complicated than that. And even to, to take those names apart is complicated. It's complicated here, of course, and I realized this after a while, that you're dealing also with Jeremy Gong, you're dealing with Jack Maru, you're dealing with Shell Harbour, you're dealing with this region uh, to, to, to some extent. And that gets hugely complicated. So the story you think is just on the memorial, it's not. It's much broader than that. Um, and I'll come back to Jeremy Maru and, and Jeremy Gong in a, in a moment. So I started to look at these names. Um, and I went to a website, and if you don't know it, you should look at it. It's the Australian Defence Force Academy website. Uh, and it's a complete breakdown of all the guys who joined the first AIF. And you can put, on, you can put in there a search on Kayama, and it'll come up with a number of names. Come, come up with 122, and it doesn't match this. You know? And that's all right, you know, because it could be forever at this, this kind of thing. But it gave me a little bit of an inroad into who was there. So I thought before I get to a couple of the names and, and talk about them, that I, I'd sort of look at the more general stuff uh, about Kayama. There is, a, there is a story here, there's a story about how the local people, you know, it's a local event, it's a national event, and it's an international event. So the, the, the locality and the way that people reacted to the war is obviously extremely interesting. Uh, I was quite surprised, because now you can go into Trove, this is the National Library's website, where they have all the newspapers, they have hundreds of newspapers that have been digitized, and you can search them. So you can search the Kayama in, Independent, you know, for 1914 to 1918. In fact, you can put Kayama into a general search 1418 and get huge numbers of hits from other newspapers that are reporting things that happened in Kayama as well. So it's a, it's a vast kind of story that has emerged uh, from that, that newspaper website, which is a, a world beater, by the way. It's a fantastic uh, website. Anyway, the, things, the kind of things that people got involved in, obviously, are supporting the troops. There's a lot of that in the Kayama Independent and the other papers, Illawarra, uh, Illawarra Mercury, etc., etc. And on Trove, I had something like 1,292 hits on simply putting in Kayama and Red Cross. So you see, you'd be a hell of a long time going through that to try and work out the story of how did Kayama get involved in the Red Cross. Red Cross, by the way, starts in 1914. It's Helen Manuel Ferguson, the wife of the Governor General, is an Ulster woman from, from near Belfast, don't get into that, um, who uh, founded, founded the Australian Red, Red Cross. And then all these little branches started up all over the country, founded largely to support the soldiers, uh, to send them parcels of things. And there's all sorts of groups, by the way, that said, in Yas, there was the Yas Boys Comforts Fund ladies. And there are photographs of them doing the knitting of the socks and packing the parcels and all those kind of things. They had a wonderful little book where they actually annotated everybody they sent a parcel to, what was in every parcel, and what had happened to this guy. Amazing little record for Yas, which we've been drawing over the next few years. Don't know if it's here in Kyle. And looking uh, on the War Memorial's website, there were a couple of photographs you know, of the activities of the Red Cross. This one was interesting here, this procession uh, through the streets. I mean, that's coming up there from the old uh, Brighton Hotel uh, down there and past. I think that's the Methodist Church, isn't it? That, that, um, yeah, that fence, lovely fence. I'll come back to that in a minute. Anyway, what's going on here? Who's taking part in that? Um, you know, people spend a lot of time, a lot of effort doing those things, who are they? And, and what were they saying at the time? I didn't you know, go through all of this. I discovered late in the day that this was actually quite late this March uh, here. Not, not early on in the piece, but through the 1918, sort of late on in the, in, in the war. So I simply asked the question, 
who's involved? Who are the leading lights, the leading players in? And there's stacks of stuff on it in the, in the local papers. Actually, it was interesting. If you're from Jamboree, the Jamboree lot seemed to get in before anybody else. 15th of August, but well, literally a few days after the outbreak of the war, Jamboree ladies invited to form a branch of the Australian Red Cross. I think they're the first one. I don't think Kawa Kawa comes a little bit later. Uh, in connection with the war, Mrs. Hugh Collie convenes the meeting on behalf of the Marys. Of course, because Jamboree in those days had its own little council. Is that right? Yes, I do remember. Yes, I do remember. Uh, by our advertising columns, we've seen Kayama ladies are invited by the mayors to meet in the council chambers on Tuesday next to form a branch of the Red Cross. So Jamboree was the first. There's no doubt about that. Time is coming on after that. The local names are interesting. Mrs. Hugh Colley. I mean, this is a name that goes way back in the, in the settlement of Kayama. Uh, the Colleys, again, were an Ulster family from North Antrim, which is not exactly the Colley. Uh, and then uh, we find that Jamboree branch is holding a grand concert in the School of Arts. Splendid program be followed by a social. So people again are getting involved, asked, being asked to become involved uh, in some way in the war. It's not just a question of the recruits, it's a question of everybody locally. Uh, and again, I'm always fascinated by all, what did they actually do? How did they spend the time? What did they organize? What were they up to? Um, and then here's one enthusiastic meeting. This was, I think, Jericho, uh, convened by the mayor, was held on Wednesday. And Jericho had its own council. Yes, exactly. They the wrong councils. Uh, and Jerry Gong, where a branch of the Red Cross was formed, eight pounds fifteen was pro promised in the room, a number of collectors appointed, etc. And here the names of people, Mrs. W. Nelson was appointed president, Mrs. H. Noble, treasurer of the nobles run family down there for years and years in that Jerry Gong area too. In fact, it was uh, a noble who gave all that orange lodge material <laughs> to all look on. Never mind, it's not today. Orange lodge tomorrow if you want to give it up. And then on we go with all sorts of other things. One of the things that uh, I love was this kind of stuff, a special meeting held on Wednesday. Look at all the names. Again, you know, it, it's asking to be taken apart and say, who are these women and what are they doing? This is where the women are really getting involved in the First World War. Communications received from applause and cyber equipment for the Carmen Military Hospital, etc., etc. What was the names that sort of fascinated me? If you start looking at them, I used to say to, to local teachers in, in the Illawarra, when I used to lecture about this back in the 70s, if you go to those local war memorials, you take those names down, those are the separate families of the district. Now, they're mixed with the that came later, but I guarantee you they'll go back into the 19th century, into the 1850s, 60s, 70s, and so on. So actually, it's a local history thing as much as it's a war thing. And certainly all these names would prove that if you started to take them apart. I like this, though, a Kayama Billy. Another Kayama Billy was evidently giving pleasure as shown by the following letter to the Secretary of the Kayama Red Cross. Dear Madam, I wish to acknowledge the kind gift received by me of a Billy sent from your society. Also, to thank you for the splendid things it contained. Uh, the thanks being endorsed by my fellow tent mates who shared its contents. We had previously received an Exodus Billy on Lemnos, that's the island near Gallipoli, where they were evacuated to in the uh, late 1915. After the evacuation, the second gift came to a surprise and pleasure, showing how well and thoughtful the Australian people look after our comfort. These were sort of Billy cans that were packed with goodies and sent off for Christmas 1915 to the, to the, to the Anzacs. And a lot of them were opened on Lemnos because that's where they'd been taken to, the Greek island, which is about 100 uh, kilometres from uh, Gallipoli. What's interesting though is that there's a lovely photograph. Here's a Billy. I love this. Uh, this bit of the world belongs to us, Gallipoli, from the Alexandra Club, Melbourne. So this was a Billy that they had packed and sent off. Of course, it's being opened on Christmas Day, 1915, and it doesn't belong to us. We've been thrown off, you know? So obviously the Billy was put together and packed well before the evacuation of the Gallipoli had actually taken place. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a marvelous photo, photo of that. I love it. But the other way in which people got involved, of course, was simply giving money. Uh, and of course, when they gave money, they loved to publish lists of who was giving what. Uh, of course, that goes back into the 19th century for all sorts of things, but there's there in the First World War as well. So there's the Bombo Quarries, if you had the most generous response to the Red Cross appeal, despite the fact that six collections have really been made during the month. Mr. Thomas very kindly presented the first, which is not quite complete. And there's the names of the guys and what they're giving Jay Roberts five shillings, Pete Ferguson five shillings. And then this lovely one from the public school. This is my bet noir in Kayama, is what has happened to the old Kayama public school. You'll find that out in a minute. It's as well, most annoying as Kayama over that school. The Ghana uh, State Public School children in second and third class have contributed towards the Red Cross collection 
by their mites. Wonderful. We almost got to have a biblical cast of mind to understand the widow's mite. You know, and the fact that the mite also means a little needed of a child, you know, as there would be in, in those classes. But there's the names, for goodness sake. You know, uh, there's Jimmy Kirkpatrick giving a shilling. Uh, and here's uh, Dee Flynn giving crumpets. You know, the shilling, crumpets. You know, what is it all, where is it all coming from? And you, you try to imagine the kids actually coming up. So what was the scene? You know, were they, was it an assembly? And the headmaster or headmistress, whoever it was, said, right, we're going to, you know, we're going to contribute now to the, to the Red Cross. This is our big day. And everybody's coming up. And their names are recorded as they drop in their throat until they drop in their shilling. It's an event. It's not just a list of names. It's an event within the school. And an event, I guarantee you, would not have been forgotten by an awful lot of those, those, those kids who actually took, took part. So these things are suggestive of that broader event that has happened in, in people's lives. They're just a, a little snippet of it. But then you've got to use a bit of imagination to think what's actually going on in the school as that, as that happens. And there it is, isn't it? It's the sequel. Um, and of course, there it is. There. And there's the sequel. I'll come back to the sequel in a bit. Not, by the way, I have nothing, no complaint about the sequel. I've stayed there. I stayed there deliberately because the school was there. Uh, and I was fine. Yeah. I think, no complaint to make. I don't want anybody going out of here. You know, Richard Reed has come down here, typical left wing, pink or radical, communist, blah, blah, blah. I'm not. I approve of capitalism. You know, and I approve of hotels being built and nice hotels to stay in. Uh, I just have a bit of a thing about that you know, and what has happened as a result. And I'll come back to it. <coughs> Other things that went on that are really, really important are the recruiting campaigns that happened through the war. How are men, young men, and not always young, by the way, the average age of the first Australian Imperial Force is 28. Average, 28. Which means there's a lot of guys about, as well as a lot of guys who are young. Uh, I've taken about 16 trips now, seven, sorry, 15 trips to the Western Front with groups. I take a lot of groups over to Gallipoli as well. The thing everybody goes in for, they find the 18 year olds and the 19 year olds. They're tragic, no doubt about it. But there's the oldest guy on the day to die at the landing at Gallipoli is 58. The Colonel Clark of the uh, of the 12th Battalion from Hobart, and he was the first man up the heights uh, at Gallipoli. When they got up there, all these young men found the colonel already there. You know, so he must have been fit enough uh, at 58 to do that, and then he was shot by a, a Turkish bullet gun at that particular point. So it's well to remember that the AIF is a more complex kind of looking thing than just all these young men. You know, it's it's a it's a kind of snapshot of Australian men between the ages of about 18 and 50. Right? And it's very interesting, I suppose. But one of the most interesting things, of course, not the only one that happened, uh, there were a lot of these marches, but the famous one that people know about is the, uh, the Snowball March, the, the Waratahs, right? That was sort of late, late 1915. Here they are leaving Kalamari, you can see that, heading to Jamboree, about the 7th of December. I couldn't find the exact date uh, in the paper. The Snowball March, the idea was you'd start at some small country town, and then you would march all the way to Sydney, right? Picking up blokes to join the AIF along the way. And you were issued with these kind of dungaree style of uniforms and silly hats as you, as you, as you went. So the, the Waratahs were here in, in, in 1915, and a few local guys actually joined. Here are the local guys who joined the Waratahs on that march, uh, that snowball march. I think that's interesting too, is to ask yourself, you know, what was going on with that in their heads? These are early recruits. Well, no, they're not actually, sorry, they're, they're, they're late 15, so they're not all that early at all. Uh, they're actually, they're actually coming in after the Gallipoli casualties and all that have been seen with the faith. Which is another aspect of recruiting that really needs to be thought about. Is that the guy who joins up in, in 1917 has got a very different war in his head to the guy who joins up in 1914. Okay. Obviously, they have seen the results. So there's, there's a different thing happening in, in people's heads and people's imagination about the war. And certainly by 19... 16 is no longer simply the great adventure by the end of 1916 after Pozzier and the Somme and places like that. One thing I found in the paper I thought was lovely was the send off to, to the recruits, to, to the Waratahs. They seem to have gone off to Sydney and then the ones who joined locally have come back here again for a final send off because this is later in February of 1916, before they head overseas. And they, they had a big, held a big concert for them. Seem to be using the Odd Fellows Hall, which of course is gone. It was in the showground area, wasn't it? The Odd, the Odd Fellows Hall? Yeah. Oh, right about that. Where was it? 
Was it that, that, was, that was the whole. That comes up again and again and again as to where they hold these concerts and all sorts of fundraising activities. Anyway, they had a, a concert for them, and I saw down here, and this again sort of fascinated me. Uh, there was a singer. Uh, where is she? Yes, Miss Ryan. Now, unfortunately, it didn't give her maiden initial, you know, Miss E. Ryan, Miss S. Ryan. Just Miss Ryan sang very prettily in a well known recruiting song with its refrain, We don't want to lose you, but we think you ought to go. <laughs> and there it is. You know, watch you play cricket every kind of game, and football, golf, and polo. You men have made your name, but now your country calls you to play your part in war. And no matter what befalls you, we shall love you all the more. So come and join the forces that your fathers did before. Oh, we don't want to leave you, but we think you ought to go. Your king and your country both did you so. And this was always to a big refrain of you know, the piano was playing, and everyone's singing, you know, marching up and down the stage and everything like that. Back in the 60s, a famous film, you know, call it Oh, What a Lovely War, with John Mills in it. And this sort of stuff came up, all those musical songs of the period. But it's happening here. People are doing it locally, and they know these songs. These songs are part of the whole British Imperial thing, so they're being sung in the Odd Fellows Hall in, in Kalama as they farewell the Moritans. You know, so that, again, becomes an event, becomes something interesting to think about who was there, what was happening there. The other thing that actually I didn't know a lot about, but I think is fascinating, is the camp. There was a military camp. Uh, in 1916 for recruits. It was a recruit training place, largely, I think, for signalers, but not only signalers. Two, there were two camps, yes. I'm just talking about one, no really, quite mind. And you rang and picked me up on that as soon as I said, hey, camp. There were two camps. Uh, and here is the camp. A couple of pictures in the War Memorial Collection, though I'm sure you've probably got some here too. A new camp has been established at Kyama. This is 20th March 1916 uh, at Kyama Point on the Agricultural Society showground. It's opened last Friday with members of the signal school. Captain Ryan, officer commanding the 37th Battalion, uh, and camp adjutant and quartermaster Wheeler constitute the camp staff. Camp will be gradually increased. So there's a story there about this camp. You know, who goes through it? How long is it here? What's the impact on the town? The impact on the town, by the way, would have been huge because of the money that's been spent by the soldiers as, as they're here in the pubs and shops and everything else. Uh, I didn't start to investigate any of the issues or problems that there might have been. And I'm sure they must have existed. You know, if you started going through the magistrate's court, uh, you might have found a few drunken balls and, you know, odd bits and pieces. That's all right. That's normal. You'd, you'd, you'd have expected that. Uh, but what I find was things like this. Forbes Times mentioned it. In Kiowa camp were all these guys from Forbes. And so they were writing back to Forbes and getting into the Forbes paper. As a matter of fact, that was really interesting. In, in 1916, Kiowa gets into a hell of a lot of the country press because a lot of their local, their guys who joined up are sent to camp in, in Kayama, particularly from the southern parts of uh, New South Wales. So these local country towns and the local newspapers getting letters back from these guys in Kayama, which I thought was interesting. The Governor General came down too, uh, Sir Ronald Munro Ferguson, to inspect the camp. Uh, and then it got flooded, ah, it got flooded. Surprise, surprise. I love this. Torrential rain in Kayama, this was 3rd of October, Played havoc with the military camp there. Matters became so bad yesterday, the authorities are compelled to temporarily abandon the camp. The troops being moved to higher ground. The camp is in a deplorable state, the water in some places being over the soldiers' ankles. Heavy rain is beating continuously into the tents. Wonderful. That's come out. You know what it could, you know what it could be like. And it was like down there. But imagine being out there at that bloody point, you know, and that happening to you, you know, and all the other things going on in your life at the time. Well, I found a little picture of Munro Ferguson there in all his splendor, giving a colour to the 58th Regiment Essendon Rifles down in Melbourne. And I sort of wondered to myself how could he dressed as Governor General when he came down from Sydney uh, to go up from Melbourne to actually do this. I forgot he was, of course, based in Melbourne because Melbourne was the, was the capital at that point up until 1928. <laughs> so I pondered about that. And again, it just comes down to these guys in the camp in their sort of dungaree type uniforms and the governor general going around who would be splendidly dressed with his equipage and his aide de corps and all the rest of them uh, around him. What an occasion it must have been for Kayama to have the governor general actually here doing something like that. Um, camp notes. There's a contingent, by the way, that marched off from here from the 13th Battalion. And I got interested in when it started and when it stopped. This lovely little dis discussion of the 21st of March, they actually marched in on St. Patrick's Day, do you believe? Uh, St. Patrick's Day heralded an invasion into Kayama, the signalers contingent, some 300 strong, arriving by the 1240 train. 
They formed into line on the station and marched from the bridge four abreast as the smart and the, this sort of got cut out there, sorry about that, figures swept by. A fitting idea was given of what our fighting men looked like on the road. A fine spectacle and a sight to be proud of. Now that is interesting, because there they are marching from the station just here, up into the showground, and people have turned out in large number to actually watch. So again, it's an event. You know? The war isn't just something happening in the paper, it's something happening ar around you, that things that you can see going on. Why the station still a bomber? Sorry? Why isn't the station still a bomber? It could be, is that right? right? No, was it the bomber no, or no, 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 it? No, it was here, it was here no, around the stage. No, yeah. no. Sorry, you have too many people there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ray's looking puzzled. Was it the bomber? No, 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 was it the current station? Was it in 1993? Anyway, so you've got all that, and it tells you Kaima was gay with bunting to welcome the first battalion to camp, and no doubt, in compliment also to the National Day of the people who have freely shed their blood and helped so well to uphold the honor of the empire in this struggle. Who have been talking about the topic of the Irish because it's St. Patrick's Day. I like that one. <laughs> Another huge issue, uh, and again, I haven't gotten to the bottom of this, but I started to think a bit about it, is the referendum. The referendum on military, uh, we call it cons conscription. It's, it was a huge issue in Australia. It was one that divided the place like nothing else. Uh, Vietnam, I know, was huge in the 60s, in the late 60s. I, I, I appreciate that. But I think, by comparison, it was small when you think of what's happening in the First World War. What's happening in the First World War is you're asking the population around the whole country to go into a, a vote, say whether or not they would send men over, overseas uh, in the first AIF. Asking him to think about that. Not just once, but twice, 1916 and 1917. So it's a huge thing. And of course, it was very, very bitterly fought, particularly the, particularly the second one in, in, in 1917. So I would look at some things about the call to arms, and one of the things that was interesting about it uh, was the fact that you could get an exemption. Uh, Billy Hughes tried to play a fast one in, in 1916 with the referendum. He assumed he was going to win. And as he assumed he was going to win, he had a Military Service Act passed, which said that every man between a certain ages have got to join up now and go into camp. Because as soon as the referendum is passed, and it will be passed, they'll be off uh, overseas into the first AIF. He had a right to do that because you have a right, the government has a right to conscript you for home service. Right? That was never the issue. Uh, I mean, you could always be conscripted to defend Australia. The question was whether or not you could be forced to go overseas with all that. Now, interestingly, the legal people say that Hughes didn't need to go to a referendum at all in 1916. The government could actually have simply declared that was what was going to happen, it was going to be compulsory service, and got away with it. They had the power under the Constitution. Don't get me into all the ins and outs, but they did. But Hughes decided it would be better to go to the people on it. And having gone once, he, you know, he had no choice but to go back again if he wanted to try and uh, get compulsory service. But there were these exemptions. You could get an exemption. And you, to get an exemption, you had to go and appear in front of a magistrate. And here were the exemption courts. And here's a thing telling you that there's an exemption court going to be held at Kayama on the 2nd of November, uh, 1916. And then it was a little report in the Sydney Morning Herald, Kayama, Thursday. And the exemption court today before Mr. Q.A. Edwards, uh, PM, 48 applicants were dealt with. 19 applicants were granted absolute exemption. 20 temporary exemptions are being uh, have been refused. One was granted conditional exemption and three cases were adjourned. And I thought, it wouldn't have been wonderful to know who the heck these guys were. And wonderfully, well, there, there's just something to show them. The vote was, you know, things like the blood vote, women voting, it was a huge thing. I can't have time to go into it. But here was the Military Service Act that Hughes passed, where you can get certificates and exemption for this. But at that time, they had a complete rundown of everybody who had applied for the exemption uh, and how they had done it. Um, and there's a whole lot of cases there. I just want to draw your attention to one, as I thought it was really interesting. Here it is here. Joseph Roy Lindsay, a brother previous of previous African, claimed exemption on similar grounds, made the same statement as his brother. Applicant said his father was in bad health, and he did not think any person could be able to take his place. It's absolutely impossible to obtain labor. This is a farm, a dairy farm. In answer to the bench, the applicant said it would be possible to organize the women folk to assist in dairy, but women could not do much more than assist in milking. I deal like that. <laughs> Times have changed. John Lindsay, father of the two previous applicants, stated the sons who had applied had been running the farm 
He himself was under the doctors and was imprisoned under the care of a Sydney specialist. No labor was available, and if his lands were taken, the farm would have to go. The most of the labor that was offering was particularly useless. Offered 25 shillings a week and board, but as a rule, the men employed could not earn it. Had 322 acres private land and 72 acres rented. And so they were granted a temporary exemption of the, until the 31st December, and the magistrate said it would be necessary for the farmers as well as other people to make some sacrifice. But it's interesting, you know, if you go through, who's trying to you know, be exempt from this? Why are they doing it? Uh, and one of the things, of course, that comes up, is when you start looking uh, at the results, and I'll come to that in a second. By the way, here's, a, here's the ballot paper itself. And again, you'd have gone into the referendum in Kayama, and one of these would have been given to you, right? The Form C ballot paper. Of course, what you weren't asked, do you want a conscript men? You were asked this question. Are you in favor of the government having in the grave emergency the same compulsory powers over citizens in regard to requiring their military service for the term of the war outside the Commonwealth as it now has in regard to military service within the Commonwealth? That's a real John Howard question on the public, isn't it? You know, so, I mean, it's, it's something that fucks people, of course. But what happened? Uh, these guys, by the way, were called Hughes and Ears. Uh, these were Billy Hughes characters who were told to go into camp because he was going to win the referendum. And therefore, they had to get ready to be in the first AIF. And that's a photograph of some of them from Golden. And they were given these sort of dongaree-type uniforms uh, to put on prior to becoming actually full, full soldiers. They're called Hughes and Ears, lovely friends. But here's the results uh, for this area, Kalangama. 548 voted yes and 786 voted no in 1916 and 17. It's very similar. 577 voted yes and 744 voted no. In other words, it went down here. Down it did not get through. In an area you would think it's quite a conservative part of the country. And I suspect this has all got to do with the farmers. Uh, because one of the things that you find in South Australia and all the other rural areas is that that those people have been very keen in the first instance to join up. But of course that had stripped sons out of farming families and they find themselves left with maybe one son left uh, to actually help around the farm. So it is thought, it's not just the, you know, the, the Catholics and Mannix and all that business about Ireland uh, in, in 1916 which defeated the referendum. It's local issues like, like that, the question of the economy, the question of the family farm. Of course there's also the labour issues. It's very complicated. But I think it's worth asking the question, why is Kayama against it? And why is Neil Warren against it, actually? Neil Warren is the only one in the majority, isn't it? Sorry? Southern, yeah, it is. Yes, it is. And Bulleye, if you look up Bulleye here, very heavily against it. And mining, 1,440 1, yes, 3,484 against. That's the miners. And that's the Labour Party is dead against the whole, uh, the, the, the whole thing. But again, it's a local issue. And it's an issue worth unpacking. All right, to get on then to the, back to the, the memorial. I went into all that because there's a whole context. There's, there's, there's a context for what's happening in Kayama, for the guys who are joining up and going off over, over, over overseas and things are happening to them. And they're aware of that context because they're writing letters back home and they're getting letters from home. So it's a totality, it's a whole story. It's not just the guys at the front. But given my particular career, I've obviously done a lot of work on the guys at the front. What does it all mean? What should we not forget? What does it mean? Here are just some photographs of, of the, the various fronts uh, in the First World War. Gallipoli, uh, Villas Bretano, Passchendaele, Pozier, Pozier there, and then Fromel in 1918. That little one down there, I don't put it up any larger, any, again, is actually a soldier's kit that was discovered by Charles Bean in 1918, the Australian official historian. He was actually at Fromel. Now we all know about Fromel now because of all that fuss about the guys who were discovered there and reburied and everything else. And Bean was actually, on the 11th of November 1918, was at Fromel, and he took some photographs. One of the photographs he had a, the official photographer take was this kit, straight kit lying out in no man's land of some guy who'd been, been sort of killed there. So it was a moving thing. So, when we go through the war, one of the things I think you need to think about with that memorial is if you look at the numbers who were killed at Kayama, and this is around the 35, 36, but I'm not going to give a figure, right? That's the road to disaster. Uh, it's hard because, again, that memorial has blokes on it. As I said, I can't see where the Kayama connection is who were killed, so I'm not going to give a figure. Uh, as soon as you give a figure, people start jumping on it, so I refuse to do it. But one of the things that then interests me is that if they were killed or died of wounds, where did that happen? 
And you can, for that to make any sense, you've got to start reading a bit into the actual events overseas that these blokes are involved in, these places. And of course, there are only a, uh, a few that one has to think of. There's obviously Gallipoli in 1915, Battle of Landing Lock by Defence of Anzac. Get through to France in 1916, Frobel. All these places, Frobel, the Somme between those dates, Pozier, Mouquet Farm, Fleur, Lake October, all of them have climber men who were killed. Uh, or died of wounds at those places. Uh, in France and Belgium in 1917, you've got Bullecourt, Messine, Menin Road, Polygon Wood, Route Sider, Pearl Capel, Passchendaele. Again, you'll find Kaima guys in all those battles, and you'll find guys who were killed. And then 1918, the same thing, right the way through Hazebrook, the Somme, Villas, Bretonova, Havel, Amia, Monsant Comte, and Vaz, and very likely again. So, in other words, the memorial is a map of the war from the point of view of the AIF. But once you map it like that, it suddenly becomes really dramatic because you realize that that memorial is referring to all these huge events that are taking place in France and Belgium and on uh, Gallipoli earlier on. So there's a way of looking at the war through the local memorial that I think is, is fascinating. And this is what I did come up with. Kalama War, Dead, Buried, or Commemorate. There are three of them on Gallipoli. That's what I reckon. In France, there are 23. Six are on the Villas Breton National Memorial. That means they're missing. Right? No, no, right. Uh, one on VC Corner, missing as well, so that's seven, and 16 in cemeteries. In Belgium, there are seven, two are on the Menin Gate, and five are in cemeteries. So that constitutes the middle group that I looked at. There's more, I know there's more, uh, because I didn't have time to you know, really unpack the, the whole thing. What I'm going to do is talk about one or two. Who might have been the first? You know, people love the first and the last. That's a tricky one. Um, I reckon it's this guy here, Richard Longstaff. Now, there were two Longstaff brothers that who joined up. Um, they were not from here. Right? They were from Victoria. They'd come and settled here. I don't know the history of the family here, but there's a lovely photograph I'll show you in a minute. In, 19, in the 1920s, Charles Bean, when he came back from the First World War and he wanted to found the Australian War Memorial, wanted to put up the role of honor at the memorial ultimately. And the role of honor was going to be put up by using documents that he had sent out to families all over Australia. These things, these role of honor circulars, that's what they were. Every family in Australia, if they were in the AIF, or indeed if they were in Britain and somebody joined the AIF, they were sent a document like this, and they were asked to fill it out. And the reason he wanted to know this was he wanted to know with what time or district in Australia was it chiefly connected, under which his name ought to come on the memorial. Bain's idea was that the war memorial in Canberra would not be organized under military units, it would be organized under place. So you'd go up there, you'd look at New South Wales, and you'd find Kaiama. And under Kaiama, you'd find the Kaiama guys, who had been killed or died or whatever it was. Bain's view of that was quite simply, he said, nobody will understand the second trench, light, light trench mortar battery. Even the 13th Battalion, they won't understand in 100 years. But they'll understand the place that they come from. And so people will be able to associate with that place. He said, if you put their names up there like that, you return something of their individuality to them. Otherwise, they just become men of the AIF, 16th Battalion, 20th Battalion, whatever it is. He felt that putting them back into their locality gave them back an identity, a better identity in his view. And he claimed that the AIF felt that way too, by the way, after the war. So he had these things sent out, and he asked for all sorts of inf inf information. Where did this person get killed? And this form is actually the form for William David Longstaff, not Richard Longstaff, because he was also killed. Uh, and he was killed on the 8th of August at Long Pine, the Battle of Long Pine. But his father, who's filling this out, John Longstaff, father, Collins Street, Kayama, wants his name to go up on the Kayama War Memorial. Oh, sorry, on, under Kayama at the War Memorial in Canberra when it's ultimately built. And then what puzzled me was that here is the horror roll circular for William, but there isn't one for Richard. I don't know why. Okay, and that was one of the reasons that it never got done, was that it was a 75% return rate to the memorial. So there was 35%, sorry, 30 yet, yeah, uh, didn't put up the, you know, they didn't get a return from the family. So ultimately they decided it was too difficult, and they just did it by unit, which is far easier for them to do. Uh, but anyway, uh, he dies on the 8th of August, but his brother, Richard, uh, died at Quinn's Post on the 24th of May, 1915. 
I suspect he's the first Kaima guy to die. Yeah. You know, he's recruited here. I could be wrong. I mean, you saw How accurate is that 24th of May? Because the rolls weren't called till the 5th. No, 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 this is 24th of May. Yeah. No, this is 24th of May, Bob. They didn't it's a lot know. Later. This is 24th, not the 5th. It was, right? It's a lot later, yes. Yeah. It's a lot later. But I believe by the 24th of May, they're organised enough to know that. Um, I mean, they're organised enough to know who get killed the first week, ultimately. Yeah. It takes a while, but they do it. A lot, a lot of work goes on to do it, but that's the 24th of May. That's a lot later. Anyway, I reckon that's the first. That's, that's all I'm saying. I'm making a claim. Right? That is possibly the first Kaiwa soldier who joins up here to be killed in the First World War. Any other offers? It's a sad <laughs> thing to be uh, to be above me by And there's the Longstaff family on the War Memorial's website. There's the father, uh, Richard Longstaff, there he is. John Longstaff, the father. Uh, William Longstaff, there. Uh, and then Anne or Marion Longstaff and Nellie Longstaff. Standing in front of John Longstaff is Frederick Longstaff, etc. So it's these two guys here. Uh, the two brothers uh, who were killed. That's really sad uh, that uh, these, these first two, one well, of the first, first recruits, and they're from the same family. This is the first guy I think is actually a Kayama guy, yeah, the guy called Arnold. Um, very interesting, and I'll come to the reason for that in a minute. Um, he's killed, uh, again, between 6th and 9 August 1915. That's a long time. And again, you notice they're not quite sure of one of the days, which of the days he's killed. Battle of Long Pine threw that kind of thing up. A lot of guys killed, chaos uh, in, in the front line. Uh, the body is never recovered, or if it's recovered, they're not sure what day the guy was killed. So it's a blanket kind of between the 6th and the 9th is all we can, we can really say. But he is, anyway, certainly to be his father who's filling this in from Kyam and New South Wales, W.J. Arnold, uh, wants him to be under the, under the War Memorial under Kyam. Uh, and it gives the fact he went to the Kaima public school, etc., etc. So this guy is a local. I know that because um, anyway, I'll come back to why I know that. Okay. Um, and certainly here is from his dossier. This is from his official army record. Uh, he gets reported previously reported missing, now and killed politically between the sixth and the ninth. These records that you can all get online now from the National Archives that the original forms relating to the guys who joined the first AIF. And there's huge amounts of detail in them. And Jonas Arnold threw up something absolutely fascinating. Uh, and I'm coming to that now. These are what you normally find are these kind of you know, printed out things, uh, typed out things, etc., which give you all the general information. What you're really looking for in these files are some personal stuff. And he came up with a wonderful thing. This, this document was in his dossier, it was filled in by his brother. Here, W. Uh, Arnold down here, who at the time in 1921, 24, 30th of May 1924, is actually in Sydney at Five Dock in the fire station. So it's filled in quite a way after Gallipoli, quite a way after the war. And somehow the authorities have been asking the question, you know, can you tell us any information about your brother who was killed at, at Gallipoli. I've never seen one of these. I've been through thousands of these dossiers. It's the first one of these forms I'd, I'd seen. So here's the brother trying to give an explanation of what happened to his brother on Gallipoli. And he's got it from his father, who's now dead. And the father, would you believe, was a guy also called W.J. Arnold. Uh, and his father had fought the Sudan in the 1880s. So this is an old local family. Uh, and there's a whole lot to unpack there about them. Anyway, just talking about what had happened, that he'd been fighting, etc. Et he'd been going, going back, and he'd been, they hadn't seen anything of him, he'd been hit, uh, and so on. So he gives an explanation, and it's the explanation the father had had from another soldier who'd come back. Really, really interesting. Fascinating. I've never seen one like that before. So you've got Kaiama, you've got your Colin Fuller, you know, the evacuee coming down, blowing out the candles, and you've got something like this. Uh, for this guy who's, who's killed at uh, Long Park. And it's definitely a local. Here was the dad, Nels, appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald, 29th of November. There he is, Corporal J.P. Arnold, Kyle, killed in action. What was really sad was that there was a little letter in there from this guy, Sergeant Host, who talked about him, wrote a letter about him, came back here on the 25th of August, and he was published independent. And then there was a, uh, another report that he was in Malta and recovering from his wounds, and then obviously later on, no, he's been killed. 
that gets you into how the family learns about these things and what they learn. I mean, that would have been awful, right, for the family to be told, no, no, he's in Malta, he's all right, he's fine. And then suddenly, no, he comes along later on, he's actually been killed, he's, he's uh, missing. So it gets back to that whole way in which families experience what happens to their loved ones in the war. And one more I just wanted to point out, there's the wall, like that today. And of course, as you go up there, as you know, it's on, in units, right, not under Kayama or any of those sort of places. Should it have been done that old way that being wanted? They could have done it, but they would have had to have taken apart all those dossiers, you know, down in the archives, and they would never have gone to that trouble. Much easier to just go back to the unit and put the unit up. But I think Bean was right. I think people are puzzled about the units. They don't understand uh, what all that meant. It's another Australian man. It's a different sort of way of looking. Okay, we're going to finish off, finish off with a story. Uh, with this, this, the story that really brought me to doing, looking at this sort of stuff, not just for Kayama, but for all sorts of communities all over Australia uh, that I was involved in when I went to the war. There's a photograph of the Methodist Church and the lecture hall in, in the 1930s, I think. It was up on the um, uh, Illawarra Library, Hooligong Library's website. It didn't actually get a date for it. I think it's the 30s because it's got this sort of stone looking fence there. That old nice picket fence is gone, uh, and there it is. And there it is today with that lovely fence. <laughs> Just with that fence. Look at the fence in 1918, for Christ's sake, why can't we put up a nice fence on it? Well, Heritage Town, all that. Yeah. Um, it was the Methodist Church that actually got me, and I'll come to it in a minute, into this whole thing. When I was here a few years ago, I took that photograph. I mean, they're making a lot of the beauty of the heritage of the Methodist Church. Uh, when you got a sign like that stuck in front of it. You know, I mean, come on. Uh, if you're going to be interested in heritage, you've got to be interested in the visual impact that a place makes on you. And you've got to think a little bit about it. Now, I'm not blaming the Kaim United Church. If any of you remember the Kaim United Church, I'm not having a go at you. All I'm saying is that I think Kaim as a whole needs to think about its heritage values and these things. Anyway, I took that photograph, and there it is. And I went inside, and inside, this would have been about uh, six, six years ago, when I was doing the research on the Irish ex ex exhibition, and these lovely ladies uh, making a, a beautiful afternoon tea. And that was the interior of the old church, because the church has moved. It's not the old Methodist church now, it's a hall, right, for the United Church. So in a sense it's lost its sort of sacred ambience, which it had back in between 1914 and 18, when the Methodists of Kiowa obviously worshipped there. So, if you like the ambience, the place has changed. But rather, I think it's difficult for these things. Certain things got left behind, right? When the new church was built and they had another place that was the sacred spot, these things got left behind. These are the memorials that the families put up in the First World War. And they put them up because it was in the sacred building. And the first time I ever saw those, actually, it would be back in the 70s. It was still a bit of Methodist church with you know, the pews and, and, and everything else. I think I'm right in saying that. Am I right? I am. I am right. Because uh, I remember going into the old Methodist church and finding these plaques. Uh, that's when I started to get interested you know, in, in, in Kyle history a little bit. And I went into the church just having a look at what, what was sort of up there. Uh, and here was this on a roll uh, for the Methodists of Kyama who had been killed or who were involved in the First World War. They're not all killed. What's interesting is you look at the, the um, list and you ask yourself, why is it the way it is? Right? Why is W. Farkas at the top, J.D. Dyer the second, uh, Kingsbury the third, and so on? Why are they listed like that? Is there a reason for that? Yes, there is. It took me a while to work it out. It's by order of enlistment. Right? All the Farkas and the guy at the top there was the first Methodist, possibly. No? Interesting thought. To enlist. Um, and then down here at the bottom, nearly at the bottom is Frank Farkas in here too, his, his brother there, and then these, these others. So, you know, there's a story in just how names appear on the memorial, you know, which needs to be puzzled out. But here is the unveiling of this thing in 1918, 31st of August 1918. Unveiling oral and memorial tablets, the above ceremony took place on Sunday evening, August 18th, by the Reverend Chaplain Colonel Prescott, assisted by, etc., etc. And, and, and here it talks about the unveiling of this memorial, and also of these plaques. And the plaques that are in there, there's two of them, and one of them is this one, uh, to an Anzac, Walter Farkasson, uh, and killed at Bullock on the 3rd of May, 1917. 
and the other one is to an East who was killed at the scene in, uh, in 1917 as well. And they have the, down here it describes what's on the memorial. In uh, 19th Battalion, 5th Brigade, AIF, and Anzac, in loving memory of Sergeant W. Farkas and killed in action at Bullock Hall, 3rd May 1917, age 25. And it was this guy that actually caught my attention because he was called an Anzac. And it was the only place in Kaima that I found somebody commemorated like that. And so it begs the question, was he an Anzac? I didn't know that back in the, in the 70s, late 70s, I found that. I just thought that's interesting. Yeah, because his brother was also killed, Frank Farkas, and he wasn't called an Anzac uh, on the plaque. He's put on the plaque later, and I'll show you that in a minute. So I got fascinated by who this guy was um, and why they were calling him an Anzac. There's the plaque as it appears today. Oh, by the way, just go back there for a minute. You see the way it is there. This was on a postcard that was done at the un after the unveiling. And you'll notice that the war is 1914 to 19 blank. Because it wasn't over. They didn't know. Uh, and you notice, too, that there's nothing here. This is just this. These things, by the way, were produced for Jubilee by Wunderlich in the First World War. They were stamped out, pressed out. So as you could put your details on like, like that, they were common. They're all over the place. Really interesting. Anyway, today there's in loving memory of Frank Farkas who was killed later on. And so that card was made before Frank was killed because they didn't have that bit on it. And actually what's even doubly tragic, and I'm not going to talk too much about it, is Frank was killed on the 31st of August, the day they unveiled those right, in France. They would not have known that. So that his name would have been added later uh, to that. And then it, it, it talks there about, uh, after the sermon, the names of these Methodist lads, five in number had fallen, they, they laid a wreath underneath the, uh, the honor roll. What I was really, you know, taken by all this was all the detail of the actual service, what's going on, and what's, what's actually being, being said. Walter, though, was certainly dead. So what do we learn from those memorials in, in that church, just in the Methodist church? We learn that Sergeant Walter Farkerson, he's an Anzac, he's killed in action, some are called Bullock Hall. 3rd of May 1918, age 25. Right, but when, when these killed in action, some are called Messine in France. A troll, it's actually Messine in Belgium. Everything was France to them. You know, the fact that Belgium was in there was kind of puzzling. You know, and I find that all over the place. Uh, and then the last one there is Frank Farkas in 33rd Battalion, died of wounds in France on the 31st of August. Maybe wounded a couple of days prior to that. So let's look at Walter. Uh, Walter. Uh, Joints, joints up, I got there 23rd of May because that's when he signs his attestation paper, 23rd of May 1915, there. And there's his signature on it. These are everybody who joined the AIF signed out one of these and put in where they were born, the time they came from, whether they're natural or British subjects, their ages, all that kind of thing, their parents' names, and so on. So the wealth of family detail uh, on, on these forms. What is interesting is that if you then look at what happens to Walter, I can tell you now he got to Gallipoli, just uh, in the 19th Battalion. That's the, the unit that he was in. And so he did serve at Gallipoli. Therefore, he is an Anzac. And that's the point I made to you earlier on about you have to have been at Gallipoli to be called that. So the parents knew that, and when they were doing the, 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 the plaque, they wanted to have him known as an Anzac, someone who had served on Gallipoli. Now, he was killed on the 3rd of May, uh, 1917. And the question then is, how, where, what went on, what led to his death, what specifically? Now, that is something that can take you into looking at war diaries, looking at Charles Bean's great volume of the, the AIF history, the official history of Australia in the War of 1914-18. I remember when I first went to Kira Boys High, the library in Kira Boys High had all 12 volumes sitting there, and they were never opened because uh, they're huge and they're difficult to read and all the, all the rest of it. And I believe, Ken, you haven't got any in the library. Not you? at the moment, Richard, no. <laughs> <laughs> you should get one. You, know, you should have it. So they were given to every high school in Australia in the 1920s and 30s, so as they were written. Anyway, Bean wrote 12, uh, seven, six of the 12. And this one here deals with the second, deals with the AIF in France in 1917. Sorry for that little thing I in there. And the, one of the chapters, chapter 12, is the second battle of Brook Hall, where Walter was killed. Walter was in the 19th Battalion. Here are just some little maps, I won't go into all the details, but the maps actually take you through what happens at Brook Hall to the 19th Battalion in which Walter's involved. To cut a long story short, 
They are attacking the German wire. Up here is the German wire. Here's the 19th Battalion. As they get up to it, there's shelling going on. They, they get into shell holes to await the end of the shelling. As they do that, the Germans get back into their trenches, machine guns, and mow them down as they came through the wire. And so all these guys in the 19th, dozens of them, uh, were wounded or killed within the first two or three hours of the Second, uh, second Battle of uh, Bullecourt. Uh, and there's the German machine guns coming from there, hitting the 19th Battalion. I won't go into too much in detail. And this is what happened to the battalion on that date. Uh, that's the bit of the war diary that they top it up. Our casualties killed five officers and 16 other ranks, wounded five officers and 216 other ranks, missing two officers and 115, total 12 officers and 347. 14 officers and about 550 other ranks were in the assault. 300 and look at that. Today we have one poor guy killed in Afghanistan. Tragic, of course it is. Look at this. This is one battalion you know, at, at Bulgur. And during that period from the 3rd of May, until uh, about the 15th of May, the AIF suffered 7,000 casualties. Uh, I wouldn't like to put a number on the number that were killed. But Walter is one of these guys here, right? Missing. Uh, at, at, at Ultimately, he was killed. How do we know what happened to him? In, in the First World War, the Red Cross had this wonderful thing called the Missing Inquiry Bureau. Wounded and Missing Inquiry Bureau. So the army would tell you nothing. You could write to the Red Cross and they would try and find somebody who had seen what happened to Walter. And they were really lucky with Walter. This is one of the best Red Cross files. There are 36,000 Red Cross files in the Australian War Memorial. What they did was they sent people out to the units, to hospitals, asking blokes, do you remember Walter Ferguson? Here's his picture. Were you with him on the 3rd of May? We only know that he's got missing. And they would give them information. And they came across a guy called Sergeant Whitaker who gave them this wonderful account of what had happened to Walter. I've been through hundreds and hundreds of these files. I've never come across such an amazing account of what happened to this one man, this one battle. You just remember, there's 61,000 dead Australians in the First World War. There's 45,000 of them killed on the Western Front, and we're looking at one, which is Walter Farkas. Sergeant Farkas, missing 5th of the 5th, actually was the 3rd of the 5th. I believe he has been reported missing. I gave information whilst in France concerning him at an inquiry held there. The following is the information I'll give you. On the 3rd of May 1917, our battalion made an attack on the enemy trenches in the Berg Line, at or at the, uh, something there, a bullet board. Sergeant Farkas and myself both took part in the attack. We reached the first enemy trench and it was so happened that Sergeant Farkas and myself found ourselves together for the rest of the day. At about 9 o'clock p.m. that night, we had decided to evacuate the position. They were caught in these shell holes. The men went back as well as the wounded. The men went back as well as the wounded. Sergeant Farkas and Sergeant Massey and myself stopped back and held the position till the rest had arrived back safely to our own lines. We then continued our journey back over the broken ground. After going a short distance back with them, I left them and stopped with a wounded officer who I noticed in the shell hole. They both went on ahead together. It is just as well to mention the Germans were shelling heavily and also firing at us with a machine gun. The last I saw of them. Both was when they were going over a slight rise over an area while shells were peppering fairly hard. I arrived back at last and was greatly surprised when hearing that they were not there. Later on that night we were relieved and I have since heard that Sergeant Massey's body was found by the relieving battalion or some other unit. If that is the case, as they were both together, I think they must have been caught with the shells. One body was found and it is possible that the missing man was buried or either uh, emerged that etc could not be recognized and so he goes on and describes all that right and this is what happened to walter he went off he was with a wounded lot he was with massey and somehow he can't be seen after that and never find him again and then he has this other wonderful little thing here about uh, uh i want to go on and refer to that there's walter and that's the end of his, end of his account that's the battlefield at bullocor and sergeant so walter fires and he killed somewhere up around here that's looking towards the village of Glancourt, across the fields, just ordinary farming fields today. No indication of, but I can take you almost to the actual spot, and that's the village of uh, Bullecourt. How do you describe a battle like that? Um, it's interesting because you can get military accounts of it, obviously, you know, this unit did that, and that's what happened to this lot, and so on. But I came across a few years ago, looking at Yas, it was a wonderful description I've ever found of a battlefield. And this guy, John Ambrose Ware, was simply a young soldier in the 3rd Battalion from Gravett Gull in New South Wales. And he was wounded at, at Bullecourt and in hospital in England. He wrote back to his mum in Gravett Gull. 
uh, he would have had a public school education, but he wrote this trying to tell his mother what was it like on a battlefield. I could go on writing for a week, but it may not interest you. And to try and describe a battlefield to you would be impossible. But if ever you saw a sheep camp in time of drought, you will know how many sheep die in one night. Our men are lying about just the same, only a drop of blood spilt to show where they are hit. Sometimes they are blown to pieces, others not so bad, limbs off, skulls knocked in, and so forth. The only burial they get at the time is a, it's a, a coat, coat over their face. I have saw some sites that they would not write on paper, but someday I may try and explain to you what it was like. Now you ask yourself the question, are people back in Australia being told what it was like? Look at that letter. It's fantastic. You know, and that guy has his ordinary school education, public school. That's rare, isn't it? No, there's quite a lot of them actually. Well, lots. Yeah, there's lots. There's lots. Once you start looking at the War Memorial and guys and letters, there's a lot of them like this. He's a particularly good one. The one I really like was the sheep. Yeah. The daddy of drought. How do you tell mum what a battlefield looks like? All those sheep lying out there, those guys, all killed. And all you can see is a drop of blood maybe somewhere on them. It's a wonderful metaphor uh, for that battlefield. Um, Walter's stuff was sent back to his mother. There's a little to see so his kit and this all what, what he had in his kit. You can find that in his thing. Um, his name is now on the Villers Breton Memorial in France. That was its unveiling in 1938 uh, by uh, Queen and Queen Elizabeth and King George VI. There they are at the memorial. That's what it looks like today. Uh, and there's the 19th Battalion. Walter's name is among the, the guys' names on the 19th Battalion. And I want to get through to this. In Sergeant Whitaker's account of what had happened to Walter, he says this. Um, As I remember, he showed me some photos of his people. One picture, I believe, was his father and mother taken uh, on the lawn, and in the background, walking up the steps in front of the house, was his sister, or either mother. Another one was his father sitting on the veranda, reading a paper, and smoking a pipe. There he is, on the veranda, reading a paper, smoking a pipe. Percy Farkas. Uh, who was the man who managed the Bombard Quarry. And that's another whole story in itself. Once you start getting into these Farkasons in Kayama, at that stage, there is a pile of stuff. And they just don't have time for it. But there's the photograph on the steps. These photographs are in the Australian War Memorial. I'm going to explain how they got there. There's the house uh, in Thompson Street, in Kayama. There it is today. It's still there. It's still there. And there's the veranda. And there's Percy Farkas Mallet. Just in there, if you can see the, the woodwork is actually still there. The house is still there. I don't know who lives. Now, see this little guy here. That is Douglas Farkas, who gave one shilling at that school back in 1914 when they had the collection for the Red Cross. I didn't show you his name first off, but there he is now. now. He was the younger brother right, of Walter and Frank who were killed uh, in, in the First World War. Walter at Bullocor, uh, Frank at Bush in France, later on in uh, 1980. There he is. And of course, he would, would have been in this building. That that all happened. That collection. And of course, Doug would have gone through the whole war in that building, probably, as a, as a, as a schoolboy. Uh, that building today, which I think is such an integral part of Kyan's history, is lost to us in a way because it was sold and made into a made into a hotel. Again, not the Siebel's fault. Don't blame them. They're just a commercial company and making money where they can. I'll never even consider it. You're not going to get into a politician. I will come back. Well, I have that guy. Well, I won't get into it, Bob. <laughs> and why I get annoyed by it is my daughter started her school life in that school uh, in, in, in 1983. I mean, a photograph of her at the front of it. You know, uh, and she's now a teacher in New South Wales in uh, Jarabombra um, Public School. So I'm very proud of Anyway. And there's, there was this sign telling you what it was all about. This was the Kyle Heritage Trail, the three R's. Now, I thought that's all they've got sitting there for it. Actually, I'm wrong. There's a nice little board uh, in front of it, which is a lot better than that. But that ought to be taken away. You know, that, that tells you nothing about it. It's just one of those things I have about the sort of the, the heritage values of God Kyama. That was a brilliant building. <coughs> and it could have been made into all sorts of things here in terms of a heritage center. Come on, come on. I mean, we're going to make a lot of the pilot cottages, you should, but that was brilliant, 1870s school. You know, it should not have been gone out of public hands, in my opinion, despite my reliance on um, capitalism for my pension. <laughs> I think we could have done better than that, frankly, but however, let's not get into it. Um, 
uh, and in the public school on the website for Kaima Public School, it doesn't say too much about it. You know, it, it doesn't really say where it was. It just talks about the school was growing, needed more space, and so eventually it, you know, it doesn't talk about that school at all very much. Uh, and there it is uh, on their website, though. They do have a photograph of it uh, on, the, on the public school website. And that's what it looked like when my daughter marched through those gates going to start her school life back in, in, in 1983. It's a lovely old building. Priceless. And that's what happened to it now, of course. But, Douglas Forest, what's that all about? Um, in 1984, when I went to the War Memorial as the education officer, as I mentioned to you, I met this guy, John Shoebridge, who was the local um, history uh, history department guy up at uh, Kaima High School. I can't remember how that I just came down in the car, actually, and I was looking for a local project that kids could get involved in, in Kaima High School kids could get involved in. And so I started to talk to John about the memorial and about names on it. And I said, and there's this one name that has struck me, and there's this Farquharson name. And I took him down to the Methodist Church and I showed him the plaque. I said, there's got to be a story there. You know, there's one of these two plaques, uh, but these are two brothers, obviously, and here's Walter and Anzac, and his Mulco. Well, that's really interesting. So I said to him, I will help you every way I can if you will involve your students, your senior students, in a project uh, about Kayama and the First World War. And the project will be to unpack that story about Walter Farquharson. Who is he? Who are the Farquharsons? I knew nothing about them. Uh, I really didn't, because those are the days without the internet, you can't get onto Trove and find all that stuff in the newspapers. You know, it was hidden from me. I got the one thing I had, actually, was the Red Cross file of the memorial. I knew about that, obviously. So that's what got me in. So anyway, John took the project on, and he got these kids to, to do an Anzac Day presentation. We got in touch with the RSL and said, look, forget about the Anzac ceremony. Let's have it up at the school. And let's have the school kids actually telling a real story about somebody from here and what happened to them in the First World War, which is exactly what they did. And they did a brilliant performance of it. Anybody think, did you go to it, Ray? Yeah. You did. It was really brilliant. Uh, those kids took this whole Ferguson story apart. But the key to it was this. We actually, John and I did an article for, for teaching history in 1985 called A Young Man in Quaint Uniform, where we explained the whole process to teachers. But this was the killer. In this is from John, an appeal for help. At this point, the student group were asked to consider the possible outcome of the research. How could, with, what were they uncovering about water and karma be taken to a wider public than the normal school assignment? Were they not really unearthing material which could help anyone interpret Kayama's most visible public monument, the War Memorial? If so, etc., etc., one way was to do this. So they put this out in the Kayama Independent. A small group of year 10 teach, the history students at Kayama High School, is working on documents relating to Walter Farkas. A Kayama man who enlisted in the IAF during World War I. Walter was the son of Percy Gower, Cresswell Farquharson, and Emma Farquharson of Thompson Street, and brother of Frank, who also served during World War I. The combination of student engagement will be, etc. Response to this appeal was instantaneous. Within a week, a number of interviews with elderly Kayama residents led the group to Walter's younger brother, Mr. Doug Farquharson of Epic Sydney. Right, that's how we found him. And Doug came down for that ceremony, he got all those photographs, and he had stories like when Walter went off. Train, uh, I read this earlier, for example, the train taking water from Kayama after his final leave was pulling out of the station. The farewelling crowd let out such a cheer the driver thought something was wrong and stopped the train. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a little gems that were in Doug's head about all. He was an elderly man at that stage, he worked most of his career for the Bank of New South Wales as it was then, West Bank, as it, as it is now. And there he was. And of course, we don't have that now because they're all gone, that generation has vanished. But that stuff sort of came up for the kids, and I just look at that and I think, that's 85. That's nearly 30 years ago. The kids that did that are now in their mid 40s. Uh, think about it. <laughs> it's a, no, no, is that right? Yes, it is. It's appalling. Tragic. And of course, in the one world in Canberra, there is the tomb of the unknown Australian soldier. And what is one of those? You know, he's one of those missing. You know, and they're all, the tomb symbolizes all those Australians who were killed in war. It can't be Walter in there because we know the guy that's in there is a 1918. Casualty. But nonetheless, the memorial cares about that, and in 1993 we brought back uh, an unknown soldier from the Western Front. And I can remember standing outside the memorial on that day with thousands of people there, and my own children who were quite young at that stage, and people around me, elderly people, weeping, and my kids seeing that, because that represented to them the coming home of relatives of theirs who had died 
in the First World War, the Second World War, and so on and so forth. So it was an important gesture. Now I think it's still important to recover stories like Walter's. Right? There's, there's a huge story behind Walter there, and the Ferguson family here. And I've only just talked about one of them. And I've taken an hour and a half of your time to do all that, to get to that. But I hope you find it worthwhile to hear that and to realize that you know, behind that memorial is all that history sitting in front of you. Thank 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 you. Concentration of men in any particular unit? Um, um, most of the New South Wales unit, yeah, 1st, 2nd Battalion, lots, uh, 19th, 13th, most of the New South Wales infantry battalions. Most of the privates, uh, wasn't a single officer among them, which is interesting. Who was killed? Sorry, who was killed? I have to, I have to say. I looked at who was who were killed. There would be officers among the totality of the top. How are prices we here? Kind of a significant local family for that. Actually, another thing about Walter and his father, Percy, they were members of the Australian Protestant Defence Association. That gets you into a whole thing about Kalama and sectarianism uh, during and before the First World War. That's another story. Yeah? Richard, uh, one number of four back in town, and there was a man there for a number of small time. He was Absolutely, yes, they're all there. I mean, the, what I've been talking about, Walter and his records, they're there for all of them, all 340,000 or it was who served overseas in the first world war, all have a dossier. So, yes, the basic answer to that is yes, you can. And if they were killed, there's even more, obviously, because the war more had collected stuff about those who were killed more than they did about those who survived. They took everybody's stuff, but they were interested in making sure those who, who had died in the war were, you know, especially looked after, if you like, in, in relation to that. Where would they get, where, where would I look at now? We need to get his full name, and then start looking on the National Archives of Australia website, and just doing a search under his name between 1914 and 1918. Yeah. And seeing if this dossier comes up. You use the uh, Alexandria Cemetery records much? Oh, well. Do you mean um, in, in where? Yeah. There's a source there. Oh, there's lots of sources, Bob. Right, yeah. <laughs> because there are a lot of men like my uncle who didn't make it on the Galilee. Sure. Taken off, died. Of that Fish wounds. in pneumonia, I think trifling. Things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean Alexandria in, in Egypt? Yeah. 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 And, sure. uh, no, there's, there's people everywhere. You know, once you start looking at the First World War, where Australians are buried, it's quite staggering. The Second World War, even more complicated. For obvious reasons. Yes, Richard, uh, with the Liberty next year, are yep. you uh, directly involved in at that time over there? No. I don't want to be involved. I'm trying to move on from war. For 30 years of it, 32 mm -hmm. years of it. Uh, once I got this Gallipoli project out of the way from the Cambridge University Press on the archaeology of the battlefield, it'll all be Irish after that. Mm -hmm. Except for the tours. I will take the tours to the Western Front because that gets me to France and Belgium, which I love going to, obviously. But uh, I'm trying to slightly move. I haven't got much, you know, how much longer have I got to go? <laughs> but uh, no, I'm not involved. Uh, yes. Uh, you mentioned very, very quietly how I'm priced. And I noticed, oh, yeah. I noticed Owen Glendower's photograph over uh, there. Uh, so the, the funny part about it is he's not on the war memorial because he enlisted in Balmain, yeah. but he was born in Kyber in 1990. Mm -hmm. And he's, there were four brothers, all in World War One. Three of them didn't return. And all uh, very well decorated, um, two had DSOs, etc. Mm -hmm. etc. Quite, oh, yeah, a, no, it's quite a, a big family. family. It's an important family. He was a lieutenant He was. No, he's a yeah. First battalion to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, 
The other thing actually which I found really interesting just looking at Kyle was how quiet the independent was about the war. I mean, one of the things that happened with the independent was that old Joseph West died about 1908. Is that right? And the paper was then taken over by the Sun, uh, whose name I've forgotten. And it became a rather different kind of paper. Old Joseph used to like editorialize and write everything. You know, uh, he was great. Um, uh, and of course, he was a stout defender of the orange of the district and a whole range of other things. But but he had a voice. Uh, but local papers sort of began to lose their voice uh, just before the First World War, as the Sydney papers became dominant in terms of international news and all that kind of thing. They couldn't compete with that. So the kind of quality of the commentary, if you like, goes down a bit uh, in the local papers, which is sad. Not everyone, but but it's there. I mean, there's hardly anything much I mean, in the independent about the conscription thing. There's a bit, but not a lot, you know, and I think they left that, the comment to the Sydney papers and to the national press, if you want to look at that that way, which is a pity. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I've, I've found very useful with the Independent, and it's, um, I've seen that more with this local paper than any other regional paper, yeah. um, was the, the way they published soldiers' letters home. Oh yes, they got some of those right. And, uh, yeah. uh, which were also remarkably detailed, except for yeah. the bits they didn't want to trouble them parents yeah. about, um, but giving some quite explicit um, descriptions of the conditions, of oh, yeah. the things they've seen, the, the way they arrived in France, for example, yeah. and, um, but also relating it back to their farming boys, so they're telling their farming oh, yeah. families well, that's about that's true. Mind you, lots of local papers did that all over the, all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, they're always interested in putting letters in from local boys, mm -hmm. quite right. Uh, one of the things you need to be careful about is checking them against other sources, you know, what they're writing and what they're not writing and so on. That letter of um, John Ambrose Ware, uh, I sort of looked at that and I thought, oh, it's interesting because we got a lot of stuff thrown at us about censorship. And of course, the letters were censored, they were censored by the officers, that was part of their job, was to read all the letters uh, that went through. But I imagine that a lot of the time the officers were just so bloody tired, they just let a lot of stuff up on the hell, you know. <laughs> And through, through that sort of stuff. So, but you're quite right. I mean, there's, there's a whole has a whole story to be told about taking all the letters that get back to Kyle. What were they saying? You know, how, what impression is gained from the, about the war? But when I say that the inter international stuff got out of it, is in the wider context, and it doesn't get there you know, because the local papers gave that away by and large by the first. Time. Not all of them, but the Independent had given it away by that point. They're, they're not editorialising about things the way Joseph did. Joseph editorialized about home rule for an hour, for the 1880s, thank God he did, it was really interesting. Any other? Yes. Do you find any connection between the Independent and the Sydney Papers? Did I? Yeah. Yeah, my uncle did. Um, actually, yeah, that's, a, uh, that, that's a story because um, uh, he died in 1944, in May, uh, five months before I was born. And I would, have, I would have been at his funeral, May 1944. Uh, he was in the Enniskill and Fus Fusiliers. And he would have died, I would have been at his funeral in utero. <laughs> quite literally. Uh, I hadn't realized until I saw his name on his grave in Tully Brannigan Churchyard, when he was brought from England. He died in England and was brought back home to be buried in, in County Down. What's interesting though is my mother would always say, you know, your Uncle Jack died because he had been slightly gassed in the First World War. Slightly gassed in the First World War. And that had affected his heart and system. He became a Harley Street dentist. He did very well for himself, Jack. He uh, was a darling boy in the family. My mother would always call him a ladies' man. Uh, I'm not quite sure what that meant, but um, I think I do now. Not then, but I uh, any, anyhow, what was interesting was I, I thought nothing about that until I actually had an Australian group in France uh, I can't remember which group it was, about 2008 or 7 or whatever it was. And somebody had asked to go out to a cemetery well beyond our normal track. Uh, we, we'd always, our last day, we'd be tracking down for Paris. So we'd be finishing up in, in Peron and Mont saint the second division memorial, and heading down the freeway to, to Paris. But this guy had this person he wanted to visit this grave way out towards the east, uh, towards Mont Blanc, which is the last battle the ALA had fought. So Alan and I, my tour manager, said, Yeah, no, we let's go and do it, you know, we always be a bit late and take to Paris. So we did, and coming back down that way, we passed this town, called Saint-Quentin. There is a town called Saint-Quentin. 
two days later, I was sitting in the public record office in London, doing some work for the Department of Veterans Affairs, and I was sitting there and I suddenly thought, oh, I wonder if the record of my uncle exists for the First World War, John Holt Weary. So we're, still, we're just into computers at that stage, so I put his name in, I popped his name up, and there was a file on him. So I ordered the file, and I'm the only member of the family that ever looked at this. This would have been, you know, 10 years ago. And the file was just like the Australian stuff, the same sort of material that you'd expect in there, the, the, the administrative stuff about it. But in the middle of it was this form that had been filled in by him when he had been returned from a German prison camp in 1918. Uh, now, in his own handwriting, right, so a long description of what had happened to him on the 21st of March, 1918, in the Enniskill and Fusiliers. What happened on the 21st of March, 1918, was that the Germans mounted their last huge offensive on the Western Front, uh, the Kaiser Tank, as it was called, and they brushed the British back, a real retreat of the British, all the way back to Village Bretonneau, where the Australian battles took, took place in April of, of 1918. Anyway, he, he was caught, he was a young subaltern, and he was in a forward defensive position, and he'd been surrounded by German soldiers, they fired gas at them, it was misty, uh, there was no point in them trying to hold out, they were, they were finished. So they were, they were captured uh, and taken back to Germany in a prison camp. So here was all his description of what had happened to him you know, on that day. And he was in, back in Ireland in the hotel in Dungana that my grandparents owned in about 1920. Um, and I realized reading it, I, I'm just past the place. He was captured in San Quentin on the 21st of March. I've just been there, you know, just by chance I've just been there. And then I got really quite kind of emotional about it because I looked up at the top of the form. Now his writing was the spinning image of my mother's writing. Same kind of formation, top hand. And up at the top, any other information you would like to give, right, to the committee looking into how it will happen to you, he'd written slightly gassed. Yes. <laughs> that phrase went right through the family. Yeah. Uh, and probably did account for his early death because slightly gassed means that you weren't killed by it. But it would, and you could gasp enough to have a fake tissue. And as I said, it's, my mother always claimed that I haven't looked at his death certificate, uh, that it was the heart and lung system affected right, by that gassing in the first World War. So it was 48 uh, when, he, when he died. So, yes, the First World War has a long reach into that. I never met him for obvious reasons. Anyway, thanks very much.